So that's another little word to challenge. And of course, Kant is a great one to challenge. No, I can't do that. <coughs> and we always challenge our, challenge our youngsters to add one more word to that. Uh, I can't do that yet. Yet. I can't do that yet. Right? And yet is a brilliant, brilliant word just to add on. So, you know, the power of words and the power of just um, some very, very simple kind of changing your phrase, your phraseology, if that's a word in itself. Um, we also talk about absolutes. And I mentioned, I mentioned Susie in the book. You never take out the bins at home. <laughs> and I go back and go, never. Sometimes I do. But, you know, absolutes, you never do this, you always do that. So parents, right? We're all parents in here. You always go, you never pick up your... And it's about challenging our own language and say, actually, whether we're using absolutes or we're using but a lot, can we change our language? Just to change climate and environment. And you'll see very, very different behaviours if you just make some very, very simple changes to language. Cool. So you mentioned behaviours. Um, behaviours are intrinsically linked to emotions. And one of your favourite bloggers, Seth Godin, gets a mention as you discuss emotional labour rather than physical labour. So just explain what you mean by emotional labour and how you think this is relevant to tennis. Yeah, well, em emotional labour, I think we always talk about, um, we always talk about working hard in sport, and working hard in sport often relates to, you know, blood, sweat and tears, and do I have a good sweat on, and, you know, often, uh, often parents will, will measure the success of a session that we do with, you know, how sweaty the kids are as they come off the court. And, and yet nobody ever really asks the question, how hard did you work mentally tonight? Uh, what investment, what emotional work did you, did you put in? And um, I kind of relate sort of emotional labor to, to two things. One is to choosing our attitude. And, and I talk in the book about Viktor Frankl. And, and some of you will, will know of Viktor Frankl, um, and I'll just find the chapter in question very, very quickly. Um, and if I can read you just the, the, first, uh, the first paragraph of this. Um, I'm sure you know the story of Viktor Frankl. His career as a psychotherapist and neurologist was interrupted in the Second World War and Holocaust. He spent three years in four Nazi camps. He lost his wife Tilly, his father, mother and brother in the camps. Surviving, he wrote a fantastic book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and I quote this paragraph to you. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the hut comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offered sufficient proof that everything... Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. And he called it the last of the human freedoms. And the last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. And that kind of relates back to that first line of the every ball ethos. You know, I am committed to fight for every ball. And when we replace every ball with every day, I am committed to fight for every day. And that means I'm committed to choose my attitude today. And choosing my attitude actually requires emotional labour. It requires emotional work. And the message for the youngsters that we work with, but the message that perhaps you could take away um, just from this little talk tonight is actually am I, when I don't feel like it, am I going to just be a victim of my emotions or am I going to um, invest some emotional labour and work to choose my attitude for that day, that moment, that meeting, that conversation, whatever it might be? So investing emotional energy is, is really, really important in, in the philosophy of every ball. And, and we also look at something called um, the four R's. And again, um, in, in, in chapter 15 of the book, uh, I talk about emotional laziness, which is, comes from Seth, 
and the four R's. And, and we have um, uh, we have here um, these four underpinning kind of values that, for me, take um, emotional work and emotional effort. And those are respect, resilience, responsibility, and reflection. And all of those. Uh, all of those words actually take emotional effort. You know, Rafa Nadal, I use Rafa Nadal as the example of a really, really humble, humble, down-to-earth guy who, who, who gives so much credit to his opponent that he expects, each match he plays, he expects that, that he's playing somebody stronger than him. And he talks a lot about humility being a weapon. And it takes emotional effort and energy to be humble. And I think humble and being respectful are, are, are come very, very close together as, as words. Um, resilience, the idea of uh, bouncing back from disappointment, ready to go again with my very best effort. It takes emotional energy to be resilient. Uh, James will know that one of my favorite words is responsibility. And if you break responsibility down, it it's, it's, it's broken down into the ability to respond. And again, that's about choosing one's attitude. Can I respond um, in, in, a, in a different way to the circumstance that I find myself in? That takes emotional energy and work. And as does reflection, so the, the, the fourth of the four R's. My ability actually to complete a match, to complete a, um, an event, to at the end of a, of, a, of a meeting or of a conversation, to actually reflect on that and look at what went well, what didn't go so well, right? And to look inside oneself. And looking inside and really reflecting takes emotional energy and, and work. So I think there's emotional energy, there's mental energy and work, and there's the physical energy and work, which obviously in sport is a heavy focus. But certainly, um, that, that would be a very important element for me, James. Cool. Yeah. So you've talked about Rafa Nadal, who is Spanish, I believe. Um, and um, just trying to have a bit of a lighter side now. So, um, we're doing quite well, I think. I mean, British sport, I think, has gone through some pretty dark patches. But I think we're doing quite well at golf, I think. Is that what you're doing? It's good. Um, I think we're okay. It seems to be coming up at football a little bit. So there's some good use there. Rugby Union, maybe the Six Nations, but maybe sort of weaker, weaker size of us, and did okay in cricket. So, asked outside of tennis, who is your favourite British sports personality and why? Maybe one, one male, one female, don't you go both ways? I can go, certainly, I can go the male from there. I'll, I'll, I'll start with that <laughs> without being uh, sexist in any way. Um, and it's quite topical at the moment, but Eddie and the Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's just come, he's just he's just taken over Sir Steve Rickworth, right? In in my hierarchy of right? because I went to see the film and I recommend it. Actually, all, uh, anyone else seen the film? No, yeah. And uh, it was a great it was a great film and and actually you know what it talks about is 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 this young boy and I don't know how well you know the story of Eddie the no, 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 no. This young boy who has a, has a really um, bad uh, knee, um, he's in these kind of um, metal things, platters, yeah. yeah. and, and um, he's given this book, and it's kind of an Olympic book, and about, you know, when he's finally out of a hospital visit or something, he's given this book, and suddenly he has this dream that he's going to be an Olympian. And it's a, it's a wonderful story of how he's just not back and knock down again and again and again and again, but he is so determined to become this, you know, this ski jumper that everything in front of him, he's a great example of actually winning, and how we define winning here at, at, at Holton, which is to identify, mobilize, and gather all our resources to go as far as we can. You know, and he went as far as he can, and um, he did the, the 70 meter jump, at the Olympics in Calgary, and he became somewhat of a, a somewhat of a, a hero, but also he was, you know, a little bit of a laughing stock, wasn't he, mm -hmm. at the time? 
And, and halfway through this Olympics, he kind of recognized that maybe he had that become that person. And uh, in the film, he makes some apologies to the, the, the ski jumpers who were, not that he wasn't taking this seriously, but perhaps he had been a bit lighthearted about it. And, and so he decided at that Olympics that he was going to do the 90-meter jump. Was it the 90-meter jump? I think it was. And uh, amazing story <coughs> how actually he overcame uh, a lot of, um, well, there was so much, that, that so many barriers really in his path, and, and he overcame them one by one and actually became an Olympian. I thought that was just amazing. Mm -hmm. So, so if you could be my, my, my up the top. Yeah, my top one. And then female, um, slightly different reasons, uh, Victoria Pendleton. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, just for the sheer bloody mindedness and determination that she brought to cycling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some fantastic work that she did um, emotionally and mentally. I don't know if you've uh, sort of seen Victoria in interviews, and, but uh, you know, she was a pretty unlikely champion in that she was actually at, at times just an emotional wreck. And the work that she did with, um, I think with one or two guys on, on, on the mental side of things was just absolutely fantastic. And, and to be able to come and achieve what she achieved and then take 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 that on and, and, and into a different sport, horse racing, I think she's she's she she's, she's, she's yeah. Yeah. absolutely amazing. So for but for different reasons. Okay. So not Sam Tom, can you do a little more of this? No, sorry, sorry, just me. Just me. Um, 